So um, today I've been given a, a new topic, which is getting real with one another. And when I was thinking about this, I thought, actually, a lot of that is about the atmosphere of the community in which we work and which we live and in which we're part of. And so I'm going to get you to tell me, have any of you, and I, I, I would find it very difficult not to believe that most of you have been in a community that wasn't that easy, what were the markers of that? So if I was to say one of mine, it was there was a marker of people dobbing in on each other all the time and quite a lot of that critical spirit really thing. What, what else have you guys come across that makes something really difficult? Yep. Arrogance, I really like. What was the other word? Big egos. Big egos. Arrogance and egos. I guess it's the same thing. Yeah, because that drives a lot of really interesting behaviour and it's very self-focused. So it's not about the community, it's about me. What, what else? Bullying. bullying, yes, which actually is often driven from that. But I think bullying is, is also often about putting, putting yourself up as opposed to other people, taking other people out. It's worse than putting yourself up. It's actually taking other people out and not in a just way. Non-personal communication, yeah. So I'm one of these people, if you're going to flick me a lot of emails, expect me to start ignoring you because I want the conversation. <laughs> I do read emails and I use them and I do them a lot, but actually a lot of us need the personal contact, don't we? To, to be able to feel like this is really, that you understand me and that you're getting, that, that, that's got a lot to do with it, yep. Dishonest behaviour, because what does that break? Trust, yeah. So... Whenever you've got a trustless thing, then everything that you say gets run through the filter of, is this right? Should we really go with it? And the, and the default position is no until you've proven why you should. And actually, that's not what we're asked to do here. So that's a fairly big list, and there's probably more on that than we could ask there. But if we were thinking about a, um, sorry, that was a difficult community, a positive community, what would you be thinking about there? The opposite. So, non-arrogant, which would be? Humble. Non-deceptive, which would be? Transparent, honest and open. Really good communication and personal. And actually, communication is an interesting thing because you can do honest and open communication and not feel the love. So, um, and you can, you can do it email and feel the love. So it's, it's not just about the words and the mode, it's actually about what's wrapped around that. Anything else? Selfless motivation. Selfless motivation. Explain that. Well, that's the opposite of selfish motivation. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of selfish motivation. Where, where the intent is to help others rather than yourself. So the intent is to help others. And here's the thing. I was doing some reading around communities and what makes society works and, um, and, and one of the key things is that a society that's individualistic and that is our society now which means that it's about yourself and getting yourself forward and putting yourself and making sure that your life or your little patches is, is taken care of as opposed to communities that are very um, community minded in other words what happens to the big community matters more than what happens to you in fact World War II is a really classic example of that here in Australia People were taking themselves off to war not to come back for the fact that you and I could have a future because they actually saw their kids and their grandchildren and their, the rest of the community as having something that was worth a higher price. And actually, when you think about Christianity, that's what we're called to. We're actually called to a life that is different, a life that is not individualistic. And in fact, our priorities are not the ones that matter. Our priorities should be the ones that are... Um, uh, should be, should be uh, Jesus' priority. So we've actually got a... Um, um, I'm just going to get down to it. A, a passage of scripture from Colossians, which I'm going to read. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Isn't that really... I mean, you didn't use all of those words, but actually when you were, we were talking about a positive community, a lot of that came out. Um, bear with each other, forgive one another, and hasn't forgiveness come up a few times today? Actually, that was one of the things that really struck me is how much of this has already happened. <laughs> I'm just going to be reinforcing for you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly and teach and admonish one another in all wisdom with psalms, hymns and songs in the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him through the Father. I'm going to take that particular verse, uh, set of verses and just go through some of it um, one step at a time. I think one of the most important things that we have before we start is that we are all chosen. None of us are just accidents coming into... We are chosen people. We are holy, and sometimes I question myself whether that ever applies, and dearly loved. You know, one of the other things that I find really extraordinary, and you see this with animals as well as with humans, actually, is if you feel secure enough because you are loved and, and chosen and that you belong, we all, all need to belong to something, that if you feel that, then it completely alters the way that you engage with everything that comes in. So that if somebody's asking you to do, do something because you're part of that community and you understand why, why that's part of what you're doing, it's not a, what are you asking me for? It's really not my turn. Do you know, like it's always about the bigger, the bigger community. And there is nothing like feeling deeply loved to give you inspiration to be um, more outwardly focused. It also changes your internal, personal moods and attitudes as well. And God loves you. There is no mistake about that. He's demonstrated it in so many ways, not just with his son. Um, the next part of the verse talks about clothing yourself. Can you read that? Yeah, you can. I can't read it up there. That's why I'm just going. Clothe yourself in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. I find the language very interesting because when you're talking about clothing yourself, it's not something that you intrinsically are. It's something that you choose to put on. And, and sometimes we think that, you know, well, I mean, there is the gift of mercy. So for some of us, it's easier than others because um, some people definitely don't get that gifting, but they have other gifting. But you're still not allowed to not do it. <laughs> Just saying. It is also part of what you're asked to do. But by putting it on, it's a daily event. You put on your clothes. Well, most of us put on our clothes every day. We should be. Put on your clothes every day. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Do you know, when I'm t I've been a teacher in nursing now for a really long period of time, and one of the things I became aware of very early on with my teaching was that I needed to teach kindness and gentleness and compassion as a therapeutic tool. And what strikes me about that is that even though we are often, um, uh, we go, of course, this is actually the framework that God has already given us. And each time I try and do something clever and think I'm introducing something new, come back to Scripture and I go, oh, it was thought of about 2,000 years ago, <laughs> maybe longer. Humility and gentleness and patience. Uh, patience is something that um, we're getting increasingly less capable of. Our, our tolerance for cues and for waiting and for um, not having what we need instantaneously. People ringing and going, oh, I didn't like that first time. You need to give it to me the right way the first time instead of going back and, and, and maybe being part of the solution. That's what we're called to here in our church. Because sometimes all of us have periods of time in our lives when we are requiring people do this for us. And what I do know is when I'm observing people who seem to get it really quickly, it's because they've people that have oozed it their whole life and people are paying them back. We're not asked to do things once somebody's done it for us, although Christ actually has done it. We're being asked to do that at the beginning as a way of engaging with the whole community so that we can build up a church that's, that's uh, really restorative. Um, forgiving one another. I found it really interesting that that came up earlier. Um, forgiveness as being um, f forgiveness. I think is one of the most challenging things in the Christian life. Not for the little things, you know. I forgive you. You didn't give me my coffee the way I wanted it. It's the really big things. <laughs> but it's the really big things that matter. 
And when I, I've, I've, I've pulled up Ephesians um, to reinforce this because actually one of the other things I really discovered when I was bring, putting together this sermon is that most of the main concepts in this are over and over and over again. When I pulled up one verse, I had a whole raft of verses from which to choose from. So whenever God is repetitive in the Bible, you really need to pay attention because it really matters. But this verse I pulled up because it says, get rid of all bitterness, which is the opposite. Get rid of rage and anger. Get rid of brawling and slander. So how gossipy, we sort of think gossip isn't that bad, but actually gossip is slander and it often really injures people. And every other form of malice. But be kind to one another, compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgave you. Just as Christ forgave you. So what did Christ do? How did he forgive you? Well, we've got the picture of the cross up there. But what was really that happening? What did he really do in that? The forgiveness wasn't words actually there, although he said it quite often. The forgiveness was deeply distressing action that was the only thing that was going to be allowed to let us go free. And so if we're, li- if we're living a life where we're being able to forgive as Christ forgave us, that means when the thing that happens to you is deeply distressing, unjust, and in the normal human, human way of doing things is not something you would ever let go of, and some of us find it easier to let go of things than others. I'm putting my hand up there. I actually work really hard at that. We don't actually, if we're going to follow the life that we say that we're following as Christians, then that is something that we are not given a choice about. I think, though, one of the most remarkable things about forgiveness is this. The main person it releases is you. Because when you release the bitterness and the anger and the injustice and the, and the insult and the hurt that's coming to you, when you can truly release that, then the emotions that go with that and the depression and the distress and the isolation that comes from cutting yourself off from people and from all of those things, that disappears and diminishes. And the gift of that is so extraordinary But the path to it is equally extraordinary. It's really hard. Just as well we've got a God that's not only um, understands it, but has already demonstrated it and will assist us to be able to do what we need to do. And to do that, one, one of the main things that he demonstrates is that he demonstrates the love and unity of the scripture. So in that in that verse it said, put on love which binds in perfect unity. In Thessalonians it says, But since we belong to the, to the day, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, hope and, of salvation as a helmet. This isn't actually from the, um, from the armour of God. It was Because I went back to double check. I'm going, that's from the armour of God. I'm going, no, it's actually not. It's a separate repeated statement that you need to put on. And I guess the thing about this is love is a choice. If you're putting something on, it's a choice. We often... Um, um, You know, if you watch movies, it's all about the emotion and the happiness and the joy or whatever that it brings. But often true love, deep love, where you have the capacity to do the forgiveness and walk the hard roads, it's a choice. It's something you put on and you make a choice that you will go down that pathway and that you're going to choose then the, the way because without forgiveness and without love, there's actually no restoration. Thankfulness was the next thing that came up in that, that uh, a lot of scripture. Um, be thankful, giving thanks to God the Father. And in Thessalonians it says, for this is the will of God. If we're following the, the God and we're, we're obeying him and taking on the path that he asks us to, it's, it's about giving thanks. I think uh, thankfulness is something that's been a lot in the research for the last five to ten years. Really interesting. If you ever want to read a very good author on that um, Brene Brown is very good. But the thing that comes out with thankfulness, if you are writing gratitude journals, being grateful for the small things that you have, saying thank you even when... Aside from the fact it's really nice to have people thank you for things, so you're creating relationships. 
the thing that it changes is if you're expressing thanks and, and, and giving thanks and choosing to do that, then it's really hard to stay depressed. So I, I have worked in a couple of places. One, when I first started my midwifery, I worked in one place that was brand new. It had everything that opened and shut and really lovely environment and it was the, probably one of the most awful places I've ever worked. Probably not the worst, but it was one of the worst. And I only stayed there six months because I, I just couldn't... It, everything was ungrateful, like it was really hard to get going. I went to another place. The building uh, was so old, they said it had ghosts in it and um, <laughs> it was actually kind of funny. Old World, World War II Vicks. It didn't have anything very beautiful in it. But the atmosphere of the place, which was about gratitude and growth and uh, excellence and restoration and moving, completely altered the level of care that we gave, but also the community in which I went to work. And I stayed there for a really long time because I really enjoyed it, as did everybody else. The other place had a really rapid turnover, and this didn't have a really rapid turnover. Gratitude makes a difference. And, and if, if, you know, if there's one thing when we're, when we're encouraging each other to live the way that we should, if people are finding a really, a really hard time, you do need to listen. And there are times not to be provocative. But actually, the question I might be asking you is, so is there anything in that that you can find gratitude for? Because it might not be the event. You know, having a car accident is a really bad thing, but that we live in a country where we've got paramedics that can pick us up and be very skilled and take us to where we go is something you can be grateful for. If that's what you're focusing on, then that's going to change the way you engage with what's happened to you. Um, oh, I do love that God always gives you unexpected joys. And this one is peace. Because it says, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Um, peace is a hard fought for thing, especially internal peace. And um, talking to some of my friends that work in mental health, we have a suicide epidemic at the moment, particularly in our young people. But the concept of having um, of having that peace situate in yourself. But if you're living in a way that is forgiving, loving and grateful, peace is the, uh, the consequence of having a place that focuses on the God who's in, in charge of everything. If you genuinely believe that he can make good out of everything that happens in your life, then it can change how you face things because it's easier to face it with courage and it's easier to face it with a confidence that he's going to give you what you need to be able to survive what's happening for you. In Ephesians it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life that is worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. This language is coming out again, the words. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. This is the other thing about peace. It brings unity. And, and one of the things in scripture it says is that we should be known by our unity, the love, you know, the love that we have and the unity that we have and the peace that comes with that. The next little bit, it says, um, it says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Admonish one another. I find that a really interesting word. Admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs in the spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I would probably find it very weird if he came up to me in the street and started admonishing me with, a sing, with, a, with singing. But um, I really, I, when I was looking at that, I'm going, it's where wisdom comes from as well. What were you going to say? No, you wasn't going to be. You weren't going to say anything. Um, psalms, hymns, and songs in the spirit. Because one of the other things about music is music brings joy. And often a lot of the music that we have and a lot of the songs that we have, they put. Sometimes they can be solemn, but often they are the thing that lifts our spirit and helps us to refocus again in a positive way. I know if if things are difficult for me, I don't put on books. I put on music to. Um, to go to work so I go in the right frame of mind when I'm going. And again, singing with gratitude in your hearts. The final thing it says is do everything in the name of Jesus. Hmm. Do you do everything in the name of Jesus? I find the concept of thinking of somebody watching every action alters the actions that I do. You know, as soon as we put cameras in our... In our uh, clinics in the remote area clinics so we can watch what's happening up there. 
some of the activities started happening in other rooms. But the thing about that... <laughs> it was put in for security. It was a good thing. <laughs> but the fact that it changes people... If people think that they're being watched, it changes people's behaviour. Hey, guys, you are being watched. Sorry? You can wave at God. Yes, you can, but he's still watching you. He's watching everything that you're doing. And um, you are being watched, but if you're doing everything in the name of Jesus, if you understand the power of the name of Jesus and what being in the name of Jesus really means, is it going to change how you engage with life? Is it going to ch- I'm going to challenge you now. Is there something that you're doing now that you're realising you're being watched that might change? Yeah. <laughs> oh, looking at that going, oh, man. I, I, uh, I, um, yeah, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> Probably safer not to. The other thing I love about God is that when you're talking, when we've talked about forgiveness and living in an attitude of love and in complete unity with people that have very different personalities, mindsets, backgrounds, interests, agendas, how do we do that? How do we do that? What would you be doing? What is it that God's done that makes that possible, actually, that a whole lot of... I was going to say weird people. That's probably not... We're all sorts, that's right. We're all different people. How do we do that in a way that really makes sense? And I think the answer is we don't. Um, God has given us a the Holy Spirit. And the other thing I really like about the fact that he's given us the Holy Spirit and he's gifted us each differently is that we aren't all supposed to look the same. I, I love it that we're not supposed to be little carbon copies of each other and that there isn't a correct way to do everything. There is a correct way to do some things. God's really clear about one way to salvation and there are some things that are non-negotiable. But for the majority of it, he's given us not only the gifting but different personalities and backgrounds so that the creativity of what we can do and the way that we engage actually is great enough that it addresses everybody's needs in the community that he's brought us to. And... If you're one of the people who does not like change and likes things to be done the same way, this is actually very challenging for you. Because living in a church where there's lots of wounded people, and if we're going to get more and more wounded people, particularly people that don't know Jesus yet, then they haven't got this background. Our our requirement for generosity and kindness and compassion is going to have to rise to a higher level. And it will be messy, and it will be different, and it will sometimes be very uncomfortable, especially when you're tired, but we're still called to this. And the thing about it is that because the Holy Spirit is empowering us, that he's going to be the one that we can rely on to get us to that. So it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but it's the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them... And in everyone, it is the same God that is at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And again, here it isn't about your good. It's actually about the church body's good. And about the people who are not yet church body, but are going to be. Because we are going to be leading a life that is attractive to them. So that they will come and see a little bit of who Jesus is through us. I'm going to stop there now. I, th- I think one of the really important things is that as you go about this week, I'm not going to give you colouring in this week because I wasn't that organised, but I am going to give you homework. And the homework is this. What is it as you go about your life that you need to reinforce, change, grow in? What is it that you need to become more loving, kind, compassionate, Uh, forgiving, gifted in, so that we as a church become bigger and uh, better, not, not numerically, I'm talking in closeness and unity and integrity as we move towards the plans that God has given us.